Big Watch. Sun Lady. Come. And uh, I gave it a half a dozen times. It uh, takes about 30 minutes, but I'm older now and my voice doesn't hold out as long, so it might get rushed up just a little bit. <clears throat> but the Spiral Jetty, what, after it was built, went underwater for almost 20 years. Then when it came back out of the water in 1996, well, back up, nobody cared about it after it was built or said anything about it, and all that time it was underwater. Then when it came out of the water, I had all kinds of people climbing over and looking at all the stuff I had. And uh, a lot of stuff disappeared. But anyway, we'll go through how this came about. Uh, that, as it says on the front of that, uh, I understand you'll build my jetty were indeed the first words that I heard from Robert Smithson. And how this came about is right over that end of Promontory Point over there, there's some huge solar ponds. And at that time, this is back in 1970, well actually 68 when we started those, the water was as low as it had ever been. And so the solar companies out there, uh, Great Salt Lake Minerals, they wanted to expand the dikes they had. And so they had thousands of acres that they put these dikes where they could run the water back and forth. And on one of the parts of the dike, they had to put a cutoff collar. That would be taking a backhoe and dig it down as deep as it could go and stirring up the sand layer so that the water couldn't travel back and forth. That made it so that the base of those things were, were solid. Now, the reason that comes up is uh, Whitaker, or Parson Construction, who I worked for, had worked for for about three years, had the contract to do a lot of this work. And uh, it was very successful and it was doing very well. And uh, we had hired uh, Whitaker Construction to do the backhoe work and dig these cutoff trenches. And so uh, Bob Whitaker at that time, I lived in Logan, uh, and Bob Whitaker lived in Brigham City. And so as I would come back from the work in Ogden, I'd drive through Brigham City and talk to him about how things were going and what was going on. We did this for quite a while. And then one April when I stopped and stopped to visit with him, he said, you'll never believe what my brother, Dennis, who was two years younger, with, younger than him, said that we would do. He, he said that there was a band of gypsies came into the office. They want to build a jetty with a uh, island on it so that they can land helicopters out there on it. And uh, Dennis told him, yeah, we'll do it. And, but we're not going to. And I said, well, it sounds just like the stuff we're doing out the GSL. He said, well, that's crazy. And we visited about it one thing or another. And I evidently said, yeah, I'm kind of interested. Or, that's kind of interesting. I'd like to talk to these people. Well, he, the next morning, when I got to the office bright and early, there was a message for me on the phone, and those were the words that came out. I understand you'll build my jetty. Didn't know what he's talking about. I talked to Whitaker, so they tell me you're going to come in and build the jetty, and we need to get started. And I started stumbling. No, that's not what I was going to do. Uh, anyway, and he said, well, I need to talk to you. I'll be there right away. And so he left Brigham City, so it's about a 20 minute drive to the office that I was in. And he came in with his wife, uh, Nancy Holt, came in the door and said he wanted to see me. And he raised quite a stir when he came in there. He was, uh, we were about the same age. We were, he was nine months older than me. And so I would have been 30 then, so he was just a little over 30. But anyway, he came in and the office was in kind of a stir and he came in and talked to me about it and explained what, what was going on. And he said uh, his, he was uh, kind of looked like a uh, New Jersey uh, uh, 
gangster to me when he came in. And so he spent some of the first thing he said, this was a, I want to explain who I am. I'm an artist, earth artist in, uh, from California, or from uh, New York. And this is my wife, Nancy, and she's an artist too. And uh, this is some of the work I've done. And he, uh, the thing you notice most about him were those searing eyes, the, the way he could look right through you. And he would, it, it would, you would listen to whatever he said just the way he stared at you. But the other part of it was <coughs> his voice was smooth as silk and he was very articulate and from the file of stuff that he'd done that he showed me. He was, uh, uh, he, he was the real thing, you could tell he was. And then he wanted to show me the project that he was anticipating. And, and this was going to be my chance, because <coughs> nobody knew anything about building these dikes but me. So he said he wanted to build the dike and go around and show me the, the sketches you, you see in there. And uh, I told him, you, you just can't do that. You need to hire an engineer to come out and take care. You need to test the soils and see if the dike will hold it up and all this, that, and the other. And he said, okay, I'll, you know, I'll, do, I, I, I'll do that. I can do that myself. I will be my own engineer. And uh, I said, you've got to have permits. You just can't go out there and build stuff in the Great Salt Lake. And he said, yeah, I have the permits and had a permit from the Bureau of Reclamation to uh, rehabilitate the side of the jetty and had another one from uh, Utah State leasing the ground to do it on here. There was an acre or two on here that was blocked out for him for 20 years and everything was in a row. And I said, then, so then the next part of the conversation was, well, it would be very expensive because just to get this laid out would be this much money and to uh, you need to have at least three feet of fill. It's got to be 15 feet five. On and on, and trying to show him what I knew about it, and went all through that. They haven't given him prices on how much that would be. And he said, "Well, okay, that that sounds good. We'll go, we'll go out and take a look at it." So we drove out. <coughs> I met him in Brigham City, and I drove behind him. And he was staying in a motel in the middle of the city. And the man and lady had took uh, uh, up a friendship with him, and they'd let her let him take this Oldsmobile, big brown Oldsmobile station wagon. And I was driving a Ford half truck, half car thing, and I, I couldn't keep up with him coming up these roads. And these roads are really spectacular from what they were then. <clears throat> When you come around that bend there, there were places where there were bathtub-sized chuck holes and stuff in there. And uh, it, was, it was, you know, five, ten miles an hour all the way in here for a long ways. And then when you got to the last part, it was just straight rock like it is from there on up. And I got out there and walked over here to look at it. Uh, the other things that you saw when you come in is there was a... An uh, oil well that amounted to a pier with a Rube Goldberg pump there. One guy tried to generate steam down in it to get the, the oil back out of it. It didn't have a dairy craving or anything like the oil well I was expecting to see. Uh, we come along a little further and come up here, and the, uh, he showed me where this was going to be built out there. and. Uh, looked at, there was an old foundation up here, there used to be a cabin where somebody lived, and a stable over there, and this was where they had raised horses in the past. The, the bad part of it was, when you walked down to the lake, on, I don't know whether you noticed the oil on those rocks and that, it's like a heavy tar, but back then it seemed to me like it, it made a, quite a stink, but it was also much softer than that. And then there was this sand down there that you go over, but the sand grains are all round. It's very easy. 
and uh, uh, the uh, other part of it was uh, there were brine flies that you don't see now that looked the, the beach looked fuzzy, but when you walked down into it, it raised up into a big cloud of flies. And then there was these no see bugs that bit you and whatnot. Anyway, the deal was, why in the world would anybody want to do anything out here in a place like this? But he showed it to me and went over and showed me where things were to be built. And it looked like it was doable. I told him I would get him a price for it. And so I so we went back and within in a couple of days, well, I got to go back. I told him he had to have a plan that we had agreed on. And if you look on there, that was the original, let's see, we're on this thing here. That was the original plan he, he brought me, and it, it was just outlined what he wanted to do. I told him you can't, you can't do that. And then with my red marker, I marked out the, the island and also marked out the, the, uh, the rock you had to build the base and then put the rock around the outside and so forth. And uh, so I well, told okay, I'll give you a price after, after you'd seen it. And so I worked up a price that I thought would, would soon have him go away. I skipped a place where when he left, uh, my boss came in and said, who was that? And I told him it was an artist that wanted to build this thing out in the Great Salt Lake. And he said, well, we're not going to do it. You told him no, didn't you? We're not going to do that, are you? And he said, no, I told him I would look at it. And he said, we, we've got all the work we can do out on the lake. And anyway, he didn't, he was, the whole office was a job, jump, jumping around about what amazing how funny this looked. But uh, uh, got the plan, made my changes, he agreed to them, went back and put the price together, gave him the price, and that's on this yellow white sheet you see here. And the, it was I can't even remember how much it was before, it was about $2,000 more than that. But at any rate, I showed him that and he looked at it for just a minute and then he had back and he said, that's not the price you gave me. And uh, what do you mean? Well, you said it was this much to do this, this much to do this, this much to do this. Divide that by $1,500, that comes out $6,000. And we, I, you know, that's what you told me. So. <clears throat> That's all I've got budgeted. This, this is being financed by the Dewan Art Gallery in New York, and that's all the money that I have. So I agreed to it, and I lined through it and changed it and initialed it. And, uh, okay, when can you start? Well, I've got to get it on the schedule and this, that, and the other. So I went in and told Paul that we have this job, and uh, looks like a really good job to me. And, he said, said, there is no way you, were, you would get paid for that. I don't understand how you would take on something like that. So called, he called the next day and went, well, there's a little hang up. First off, I tried to insult him by the price. And then secondly, I had uh, tried to insult him about the uh, terms of the payment and so forth. And I told him, yeah, we have to have uh, the money in escrow, made out so it's only dust. He said, well, if that's a problem, I'll write you a check right now. So he wrote the check. So I took it in. Yeah, we've already got the check. Uh, uh, checks on the New York bank. How do you know that will, yeah, how do you know that will uh, go through? So I had to go talk to the, the finance director, the, money man at Parsons went in and showed him that what it was and he said, yeah, I can't, uh, why would we even want to get involved with something like this? If there's any question at all, why do we really get insulted? Well, just call and see if the check will clear. Well, it's a long distance call. Well, finally he did call and they said, no, we won't tell you how much money he has, but that check will clear easily. 
So I went back and yeah, the checks were clear, <coughs> got the money, everything's a go now. No, I, I really don't want to go back out there. Can you just tell him we're not interested? And finally he said, well, if you can get <coughs> Grant Busenbart to put one of his loaders and a truck in with us, uh, we'll go ahead with it. Uh, Busenbart had his uh, nickname was Boozy for a number of reasons. But anyway, when we t talked to him about it, he was all for it. He, here was a chance for to him to put his loader and his truck to work. So we lined up a second uh, truck from the company and a, uh, a rubber tired loader to come out and load the, the stuff in. And that's what you see on there, the truck and the loaders working down in to put, it, put that in. But uh, <coughs> come out and the first day they came out and unloaded the machine down and one of the truck backed up and he got too close to the edge and where the lake bed meets the beach there was a soft spot there and they went down in and the truck got stuck and uh, it took them, they didn't think they would get it out and so the job was probably over but they, he got them to get a bunch of the railroad ties and stuff that had washed up on the beach and they went in and got it put together and, and got it out and I didn't even find out about it till the next day. It probably hadn't gone out there. But the work went well as, as they built it and they, they gathered the rock from along this edge and made a trail down through there that you can see and that's the rock and stuff that, that, was, that was put in it. Uh, We, uh, everything was going well, and then one evening, I got a call from uh, Smithson saying I had to get rid of Boozenbart. You, you just got to, he has no place on him, you need to get rid of him. And I tried to convince him I couldn't do that. Uh, that was his machine that we were using to load that, and all. you just got to get it out of here. We've got to have people on here that understand what we're trying to accomplish. So, as I said, I lived in Logan. Went back over the next morning and talked to Paul about it. He was worried that, what would I do? What should I do? He said, tell him that's it if he wants us to pull off. We've already got his money. We'll just let that go, <coughs> let it go. So I practiced saying <coughs> no long. As, we, as I drove back out here, and as I come up along this roadway here, things were going really well. He was he would sit up on this hillside and look, and then he would run down and through a series of strings and stakes, he would stake this circle, and then when they dumped it, he would have them move it here, there, where it was. But he, he you know, couldn't get his attention. And finally, he could come waddling over in his <coughs> rubber waders and said. Everything's all right. Never mind. Everything's fine. We're doing well. <laughs> Took off and went the other way. Asked Grant what had happened. <coughs> and he said that my voice is gone. He said, We had got done with the shift and we were up washing the salt out of the trucks and stuff, and getting them ready to park and go home. And uh, Smithson was walking back and forth, back and forth, and looked at it. And he walked, when he walked up to the end where he was, <coughs> Grant said, It turns me on, it turns me on. Now turn me off so I can go home. And he, he really took offense at that, I guess. But Grant said, uh, You know, I didn't, I didn't know I'd done anything. I didn't know anything had gone on. So he hadn't even talked to him about it. Well, uh, the next thing that came up was an argument about how much sand was being put in the bo bottom of the trucks uh, to protect the beds from the big rocks that were being put in. And uh, it was a constant haggling. As you can see in those uh, pictures on there, 
looks like a big dusty road going down through there. <clears throat> and so I came up with this idea that I would get a water pump and mount it on a big inner tube and bring it out there and we'd high pressure water and blow all that out of there and just leave the rocks there and he's no that's we'll get along with it. Oh that'll it'll really work. But no. It's okay. So went along just the way it was, cut down some. <clears throat> but when he got done, down to the end of it, he uh, told Rosenbart to turn the machine around and he took the, the uh, scarifiers and put them down in there and went back and forth on there, pulling the rocks up and letting the sand and stuff go down and moving the rocks to the side. Now, in the picture he drew here, where there, uh, he's got the rocks, the small rocks and big rocks and gravel, and I told him, no, it has to be dirt, and then rock, big rocks on the side, and then the smaller rock on the top. <coughs> and him move it, and when he kept come up and that stuff, come, the rocks came to the surface, he got that, and when you look at that, <laughs> He got exactly what he was wanting there. How he knew that that machine would do that uh, it was amazing. Uh, the, uh, the next thing that came up was, he said, we're doing very well. And, uh, you know, I think you could probably handle this. And we're going to go down to Moab and look at some other projects you might be interested in. And <clears throat> about totally, you know, I just, you'd have, you couldn't run fast enough to catch me to get in another deal like this. But anyway, he left, and I swear the next morning it wasn't noon before he was back. And he said, there is no way that I could make any kind of an impression on that country. It's just too, too big. I don't know whether that was the case or whether he was afraid I'd screw it up. I think the latter played, well, probably played, paid a pretty good part in it. When he got done, the pictures on there show the, the spiral that we were going to build. And then he did some sketches on there and he wanted to cut the spiral off and put a big island on the end of it. And so it was like a a J out there, a big J with that ramp. And they, they build it all, got it done. He says, that's, that really looks nice. Uh, he didn't say nice, he didn't put a word to that, but that's just great and good job and one thing or another. <coughs> we all just went home and nobody had any hoorahs or anything. Well, it was two days later he called and said, it's not right. It's not right, you've got to help me. You've got to fix this and make it right. And so uh, he talked me into riding out with him. And uh, the uh, pictures that he would take, he had photographers here all the time, visitors from all over the world, and especially Europe here, and, and one thing or another. But the pictures he took, he took on a Polaroid, and I guess at that time they were a pretty big thing. But he had this Polaroid picture of the jetty, and he said, uh, we need to take that out and put this other loop in like that. And he pressed down on it, had a ballpoint, it wouldn't ride on it. He went around and around it. I told him he had really searing eyes, and he went around and poked through, and I thought he poked it through his hand. And it must have scared me or something, kind of jumped back, and he said, oh, so you see what I'm talking about. We need to make that right. I said, well, I can't do that for nothing. And he said, uh, well, okay, I've got, how, yeah. I said, it, it would take $2,000 to, to make that change. And he said, uh, okay, we'll, we'll do that. I've got a thousand I can give you now, and I'll give you a thousand later. Well, I went back and talking about, trying to figure out how I was going to tell my boss that we were going to go back out there. What were the chances that we would come out of there without smashing through there and sinking in the mud? Uh, what, what could I do? So instead of talking to 
Paul, I talked to Grant and asked him if he would go back out there, and he said he certainly would. And in fact, he was pretty sure he could do it himself with just him and his truck. So he came out, and within a day and a half, he took his loader out there and uh, out of the material that was in the island, he made the, completed the squirrels around the other side. And went out to see it, and then at first it was just a jetty with a helicopter pad. When you went out the second time, that's what you saw, and it was really beautiful. That, pay, that picture has faded a great deal because the, the stuff in the jetty was almost tomato soup red, and uh, the, the uh, salt showed up through the bottom. The salt would build up on the black rock and then when it would rain it would wash it off and it would be completely black. And I don't know if you noticed the foam or that when you were there, but it's almost like cellophane. And the wind would blow that in and out and around and around and you really got a big kick out of that. So, we, again, had the money, everything was done, banks, and that was pretty much it. And uh, didn't think anything about it. Uh, nobody particular, nobody from the company other than the guys that worked on it ever went out to see it. Uh, but he called and said, I have a film that we made about the Jenny. Uh, do you think your company would be interested in showing it? And yeah, I think they would. And so he came and he brought a 16 millimeter what? projector. Yeah. I guess it was a 16 millimeter film. And he and Nancy set it up and got it all ready to go. We set up seats in the auditorium. And the people that came to work there came thinking, uh, we're going to see our big machines crashing and throwing rocks around. And, and uh, it's. Uh, going to be a real show for the Whitaker, or Parsons. But anyway, when the show come on, uh, we've had almost 40, 50 people down there. Uh, it started out, and I have no way of describing what went on, uh, but he talked about this representing a whirlpool into the sea, and that it probably came with just dinosaurs, he showed dinosaurs. And, and he started talking about the points of the compass, each direction that came. And then for just a short stint, it showed the rocks and gravel falling in in the trench. Went on and on. But as it got going, uh, the one, one of the vice president of the company said, what is this, Blake? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to sit through that. What? This is a joke, right? And he got up and went. Uh, Two or three more got up and went, and so instead of watching the movie, I'm sitting over and watching him. And he's just really interesting, everything that's going on there. And I looked up at uh, Nancy, and uh, she, she's really upset. But uh, he gets done with the end of the film, and he comes running over. Did you like that? Did you understand what I was trying to do here? Did you? And I, I didn't, but yeah, yeah, that's good. <laughs> He said he was actually really interested that, that I appreciated what we had built. Well, he uh, said I, I brought some things for him, and he had brought them for the company, I suppose. But the one of them was this picture, and it's I forget the guy's name. Shouldn't do that, but I won't take the time to look it up. But he's from France, world-known photographer. And he brought that, that picture. And then he had uh, some outtakes of the film that you saw there, the trucks and that working. <coughs> he gave me those because we didn't have any pictures of anything they'd done. And then he had a black and white picture, two of them, of the spiral jetty. And it was an 8 by 11 picture there. And he said, I'm not sure this is what you're waiting for. And he took out a like a marker and wrote for Bob Phillips, Robert Smithson, and on the end it kind of smeared just a little. And he said, uh, I said to him, on this one, let's move this over so, oh no, no. 
you only get one to put the name on it. You put that in the safety port deposit, and this one you put on the uh, on the wall. Oh dear. So I thought that's that's really neat. So I took it down to a place it was a little just a little square to a photo place and told them I wanted to make enlargements of that as big as I could and I wanted two of them. And they made them for me and uh, took and framed them myself. Took one into the main office there and was going to hang it up. And I said, Why? We don't want that thing in here. Take it back to the, your office down in the asphalt company. So I went down there and was going to have it on the wall and uh, Paul was the one that said, no, you hang that in your office. You don't, you don't need that out here. And so I was stuck with the two films. Well, I gave one to uh, Bovenbark and he has a cabin in, up in Alpine, Wyoming and he puts it, has it hanging up there and he said he's had all kinds of people come and talk to him about that. This poor thing in my house went from wall to wall to wall and uh, one of my friends come in and was asking, what is that? And, well, it's a spiral jetty. What, what does it do? Well, it really doesn't do anything. Uh, it's earth art, earth art. So, how do you, it's just like a sculpture. How do you see it? Where do you go? And I said, well, you can go out there, but right now it's underwater. He said, that is really neat. You built something with no use and got paid for it. And what, a, what a deal. So, Judy went to, was it Grand Central or Gibson's or somebody where, and bought two pictures, one of a, a bullfighter and one of a girl dancing and squirrel spider, spiral jetty went downstairs on the basement wall and those two went up on, on our wall so she didn't have to keep answering all these questions. Uh, when it moved, when we moved to Ogden, it ended up being down in the, in the home, <coughs> in the family room downstairs. But uh, occasionally somebody would come and see it and want to know about it. Uh, this came about uh, sometime later, uh, but before, yeah, it, it was in the, when my, that Michael was 18 months old, and he had, so it was a, about a year and a month or two after that, and it got a call from Smithson and he said, we're in town. Uh, in Logan, we've rented a, sometimes I remember a helicopter and sometimes I remember it as an airplane. But at any rate, he said, we want you and Judy to come enjoy this. And, oh, I can't, I can't possibly do that. I'd be so, I'm so busy or if I got something else to do or something. Well, we want to talk to you. I want to talk to you. I haven't seen you for a long time. I need to see you. So gave me his address and he came. And he came and Nancy and... Uh, this photograph that had been there. Well, Michael was on the floor rolling around with these Oxford shoes, and he got right down on the floor uh, with him and rolling around. And I looked over, and Smithson was just a smiling. That's the first time I'd ever seen him smile and look like he was happy. And uh, Nancy, Nancy was too. But at any rate, he said, "You'll really enjoy the jetty. That's what." It for us to enjoy. He said the, the froth that's on there is just like battleships or sailing ships darting in and out through there. Be sure you won't go. It's just, it's just really, now's the time to see it. Um, no. Well, <clears throat> sometime later, uh, about uh, six months or so later, uh, Grant Busenbart called me and said, your buddy uh, died in an airplane crash. And uh, he had gone to Amarillo, Texas to look to see if he could uh, uh, 
build a the ramp, he called it, and it got too close to the ground, crashed and died. So we didn't hear anything from that, but always regret it. Here I had a chance to go with the artist out and visit it in an airplane and see that, and I turned him down and thought about that a lot through the, through the years. When I found out, first, nobody was really all that interested in the jetty, but then in uh, in May of uh, 71, the, this was the, the uh, it's called her Dirty Pictures. And find the center pole with this. Anyway, it was all kinds of first sculptures that they had done. Here the spiral jetty was right in the middle of it. And oh yeah, the jetty is, is something special. So we <coughs> started taking a little better care of that. And, and uh, but it things really died down. And uh, the next time that the jetty became important was when my, the same son, Michael, came home. He was going to Weber State. And he came home and said, you're not going to believe it, your jetty is really one of the most important art things and we've been studying it and uh, on and on. But anyway, there, there was it. It was a centerfold to the Esquire. And so that was kind of my 30 seconds of glory, I guess. But uh, uh, he, I dug out all this stuff, and I don't know why I had saved all these things. Uh, I didn't usually save things from jobs that we'd done. But I had a lot of this stuff saved, and he took it to school with And they looked over it. I think he probably got an A on it, but I, I don't know for sure. He, uh, but he had all kinds of people wanting to talk to him about it, wanting him to give the material to the to the to the uh, departments or whatnot. And it was, a lot of people kind of want to see it. And several things kept disappearing in that, so we finally he buttoned it up and hid it away, and then nobody got to see it for a long while. Uh, the jetty in 83 was when the big storms came and the storm water was running down State Street in Salt Lake City and got to be, they had to put dikes on the side of the city and for the water to go through. <coughs> and it, it just kept going up and going up and going up. And so uh, the, the jetty wasn't visible and that nothing happened, it was just stayed quiet. The lake got so high that it threatened the interstate highways on the far south end and they had to move that over. And then it uh, started, it wiped out the, uh, even though they raised and raised and raised their dikes, it wiped out much of the production from great salt minerals and the solar salt ponds that were out here. And it was, looks like it would take up a great deal of the farming in, in the, that way's east end of it. So they came up with a plan to put a big pumping station in. But right over here by that, where that notch is, and there's a huge bay for the water to come into, and then three huge pumps to pump. 30 inches of water at a time. They run it out to the salt water, or to the dike, or to the salt flats, and then let it disappear from there. Uh, they, by the time they got it done, the water was already going down, but they did start it and run it. 
for a while and got it down to the, that elevation. But it won't do the, the jetty any good because it would only have lowered the water four feet. It was already 14 feet under the water, so it's not, you know, never going to see the jetty again. But then in 96, uh, the lake went down and uh, the jetty began, you began to see the, the rocks there. And what's her name? Uh, Nancy Holt had sold or given her, uh, given the sculpture to the uh, to a gallery in New York City. They wanted to have a big party out here. This, this new art piece that they had. And so I, I got a call from uh, the uh, Salt Lake Tribune for a guy to come out here and he was kind of giggling at me. These people are out there toasting and carrying on about this that they got and you can't hardly see it. Well, the, uh, uh, anyway, you can see the rocks out there. And, uh, we, I took, Rosenbart came with me. We had a hard time finding it. I finally found it and got out there, but, but uh, it was still knee deep in there. But it did make the papers and the interest started and then it went down and down and down and uh, and the state art people talked to me and I talked to them and had people come from uh, Switzerland. This professor has his class and they come three times. Uh, they came three times to see it to bring, it, bring their students. Uh, guy from the London Post and uh, just all over the country. Uh, we had tour buses come from California three different times to, to hear this, and one group that came from back east somewhere. There was only six or eight of them to, to see it, uh, but it was really popular everywhere but here, and it doesn't it doesn't get in much attention around here. In fact, uh, Roger Andreasen, who was running in the big uh, rubber tire roller here, I called him to ask him uh, who was going to come up here and talk to him. He'd want to come up with this viral jetty, and he didn't hardly remember it. And he said, well, I remember something about it, and so he'd like to come out. And he said, well, I'm awful busy. Can I get back with you on that? And he didn't <laughs> ever. And the only other one, there's only three of us left now, the, the other one, uh, Grant Busenbarg's been out here maybe four or five times, but uh, the company that I worked for, he had a, uh, an art uh, exhibit, and it was called the, uh, the Influence of Robert Smithson on Art. And they asked for uh, uh, if I would come and do some a little short talk to put on their website. Uh, but anyway, that that uh, show was uh, advertised highly in the paper, and I got a call from Scott Carson, who is. Uh, third generation, and he said, uh, what do you know about this jetty? Well, wasn't Parson involved in that? And I said, yeah, he said, Parson built it. And he kind of told me to come talk to you about it, so I went in and talked to him about it, and he acted like he was really enthused. And finally, I said, uh, you know, would you like a picture to put up or something like that? I left a book there that I had for him to read. He said, well, I need this to get this to our PR people to see if we can uh, do something with this. So fine. And so he kept everything. He said, I'll get this copy and get it back to you. Uh, some time went on, and then another uh, agenda or thing came up to come talk with uh, uh, Westminster College. But anyway. So I called uh, Scott and told him I needed the, the uh, 
items back, and he was he was very hard to find. Finally, when he finally said, "Yeah, I'll have them ready," and uh, my assistant will have them so you can pick them up. And I went in there, and, <clears throat> and she didn't know anything about it. And then finally, she got a hold of them and said, "I need to copy these before I give them to you." So he hadn't done anything with them. And then I called him and asked him, left word, did he want to be involved in this or done anything. Never heard anything back. So the company, the company didn't care about it all that much. Uh, the uh, things that went on was, was how in the world did Smithson get this built with all the, first of all, couldn't find a contractor who would do the work. He did have, he thought he had a job at Kennecott Copper doing some things there. <clears throat> but uh, he didn't, and then he searched the lake and found this place. How in the world he ever found this, I don't know. Uh, but if you look on the map, this is the only place where all, uh, from the high water to the low water, where they all meet together in the one shelf here. So regardless of how high the water is, the jetty starts and goes in the same place. Other parts of the jetty would be, the light would be dry out maybe as much as a mile out there before the jetty had started if you'd, if you'd build it at that particular site when the water was where it was. Uh, the other thing was he uh, uh, had to get along with the uh, the oil well guy and the, uh, the rancher that was here and he said <laughs> the rancher told him no he didn't want him he couldn't come out here and he went and researched it and found out that this is state federal property and this is uh, a Weaver or a Box Elder County Road and he took all of that and, and did it but they didn't want him out there. And then when he finally, when uh, Whitaker told him they wouldn't do the, wouldn't do the work, and then he finally came to me and I tried five different ways to keep from doing the work. And still when it was uh, all over with, he, all over with, he thanked me for a good job and uh, we were friends. And I had never thought that would, that would happen. Turns out he lost every battle, but, or, but won the war. He got what he wanted uh, by negotiating and getting along with everybody else. So, uh, the place has really changed. This was really rough in here, and this picture uh, on the back of your gooey out, uh, well, it screwed down as far as I thought it was. But that was on a big rock right there, where I could sit look down. And I called that my reflective thinking rock, and it disappeared. Uh, so it isn't, it isn't anything like it was. The road would be better. The, uh, you used to have the run of this. I see they've got no trespassing signs all over it now. Uh, the oil well that was here and putted along it, while well, the water came in, it disappeared. And then the brine shrimpers came in and they built this dike and a big uh, trench in there so that they could get their uh, boats in and out. And they had a big trailer house there that the workers and that lived there. And a lot of people would come out, see that, that's the jetty, turn around and go home. Uh, so it's still, don't, don't know what, what that is. Uh, boy, I wish you could have seen it when it was brand new because it sure was beautiful. But, <laughs>